So let's go ahead with 2.5. So we've kind of been beating around the bush about this. Um, this section is on something called continuity. Um, and to start off, um, there are three functions, three common functions that have domain issues. We have to be careful about what we plug in. What are those three functions? Okay, logs are one, even roots, x in the denominator. So whenever you've got division, okay? So you can't divide by zero, you can't take an even root of a negative, and you can't take the log of zero or a negative. None of those things are allowed. Okay, there are certain numbers that when you plug them in, the function doesn't operate. Okay, the answer to that does not exist. We can't divide by zero, we can't take the even root of a negative, and we can't take the log of zero or a negative. Okay, um, and when we were covering the last couple of sections and we were trying to find limits, there were some that were pretty darn easy. Um, they were really nice limits to find because all we had to do was just plug in the point of interest. Plug it in, it worked by substitution, it spit out an answer, okay? So in those cases, it was really easy because the limit was the same as the function value at the point of interest. So we could sim simply substitute the point of interest into the function. So a couple of examples. If we're finding the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 3, nothing weird happens on that. So we can just plug it in, plug it in, square it. We've got this graph right here. We're interested in what happens at 2. Answer is 7, right? Piece of cake. Just plug it in. If we're trying to find the limit as x approaches 2 on the greatest integer function, now you'll remember what that looks like. The greatest integer function is a step function. It runs along here at 0 until it gets to 1. And the second it gets to 1, it jumps up to 1 then runs along 1 as a horizontal line. The second it gets to 2, it jumps up right here, and so forth. Okay, So we call that a step function. That's the greatest integer function. Just pretend I made all those the same length. All right. Okay. So here's the point of interest. Our point of interest is at 2, and this is a two-sided limit. So again, like we checked before, we say, well, it's a two-sided limit. You need to check from the left. So if I check uh, as it approaches 2 from the left, the function value is always 1. Oops. Function value is always 1. And as I approach it from the right, the function value is always 2. So because the two of those don't agree, that limit does not exist. From the left, it's 1. From the right, it's 2. And because those don't agree, it doesn't have a limit. It does have a function value, though. The function value right here, so if I did f, let's see, let me write it this way. If I did the greatest integer for 2, it's 2. Okay, But it doesn't have a limit. And what we're going to kind of explore and talk about today is when, when do we have an easy limit to find, something like this, and when do we not? When is it more complicated? Um, and um, basically comes down to this. It's really easy to find a limit if we look at the graph and it has no jumps. No gaps, no holes, or breaks. If that's the case, if we have a nice, smooth function like this, if we can draw the whole thing without lifting up our pencil, then it's going to be really easy. Okay? Those are called continuous functions. So no jumps, gaps, holes, breaks, or anything weird happening on, on something like that. Okay? So we use the word continuous a ton in calculus, and we want to make sure that we understand what it means. Again, like I mentioned, a very imprecise way to talk about this would be that we can sketch the entire graph, the whole thing, without lifting up our pencil. So if you take a look at x squared, you can go from one end of the domain to the other end of the domain, and you can draw that entire parabola without lifting up your pencil. Same with e to the x, an exponential. Same with the square root of x. Yeah, the domain isn't all real no numbers, but from one end to the other, you can draw the whole thing. It starts at 0, 0. Okay, it's just the top half of a sideways parabola. The whole thing is continuous. The entire thing can be drawn without lifting up your pencil. And if you think about the sine and cosine functions, okay, they look like this. You can go from one end to the other. It's just a squiggly line, the cyclical function. Okay, ln x. 
Yeah, its domain is only positive numbers, but you can draw the whole thing from this vertical asymptote rising up over here. Draw the whole thing without a pencil. And even combinations of functions like this. 3x to the 4th. Well, x to the 4th, yeah, it looks something like this, maybe a little bit steeper. And 3x squared looks something like that. Add those two together. If these two are continuous, the whole thing's going to be continuous when we add those together. I'm going to be able to draw the whole thing without lifting up a pencil. Okay? Now, not every function is continuous. So if you look at this example right here, in example 1, we had a parabola, and it was continuous. But this one over here, this step function, in order to draw this, I draw that little piece, then jump up to the next little piece, and then up to the next one, and so forth. Okay? So that's not a continuous function. So let's look at a couple of other examples of functions that are not continuous, or we use the word discontinuous. So if I think about 1 over x, 1 over x look, looks like this. It's got a branch right here and a branch right there. Okay. I can't draw the entire thing from one end to the other. It comes in two separate pieces, two separate branches. Okay. So that's going to be discontinuous at 0. Okay. And we're going to make technical arguments a little bit later about this one. Um, so bear with me and wait for that. If I think about x squared, piecewise function, looks like that when x is less than 0. And then it looks like this horizontal line when x is greater than or equal to 0. It looks like this. Open circle at the end. And then it looks like this. Okay, That's not continuous. Because in order to draw this, I've got to draw the parabola and then pick up my pencil, jump down here and continue on that horizontal line. Okay, Sine of 1 over x. Okay, Now, this is a kind of a good exercise. If I think about what type of numbers, ignore this for right now. Ignore the 1 over x. It's a sine function. What type of answers are going to come out of the sine function? Yeah, somewhere between plus or minus 1. So it's going to be an oscillating function. And the weird thing is, we do have one number that we can't plug in. You can't plug in a 0. And I think when we looked at this before, here's what happens. We get this kind of rolling function like this, and then the closer it gets to 0, so say 0 is right here, it just oscillates back and forth. It goes up and down and up and down. And then the same thing from the other side. It scribbles around like this. But there's no point when we plug in a 0. The function does not exist at 0. So if we were to zoom in, there's this little gap right here. Okay, Those two pieces don't connect. As much as we'd like them to, and maybe they oscillate back and forth and get really close to each other, they never touch. So it's in two completely distinct pieces. Okay, And if we do something like this, and I think we've actually graphed this one before. This is a rational function, but you can factor the numerator plus 1 and plus 2, and you can cancel this one. So if I were to graph this, it looks like the line x plus 2, but there's one number I can't plug in. What is it? Negative 1. It's got a domain issue there. It's going to have a hole right there. Okay. So those are lots of different examples of functions that are not, not uh, continuous. They're not connected graphs, if you wanted to think of it that way. Okay. So there are four different types of continuities. Okay. There's an infinite discontinuity. That's basically where we have a vertical asymptote. Okay, Vertical asymptote. There's a jump, which is exactly what you'd think. This example right here is a jump. Okay, We've got a hole. Okay, So an example of a hole would be something like this one right here. Crosses at 2, and it's got a hole at negative 1. So like that. And then we've got an oscillating discontinuity. So the example that we saw a second ago oscillates back and forth like this. Okay. Now, the ones that come up most often are definitely vertical asymptote. We will see jumps sometimes, but it's pretty, I mean, you have to make usually a piecewise function in order to make a jump and a hole. These two probably come up the most. Okay. Jumps will happen occasionally. Oscillating discontinuities, I'll be honest with you, they, they don't come up very often. Okay, So those are the four different types of discontinuities. Okay, Four different types of discontinuities. And on the test, you ought to know what they are and you ought to be able to draw an example of them. Okay, So anything with a vertical asymptote would be a uh, an infinite discontinuity. Jumps and holes are pretty, uh, jumps, holes, and oscillating, they're all pretty self-explanatory. Any questions there? Yeah. 
Well, it, it's not really a hole. A hole is more like, okay, I go to this point, I've got a little hole in it, and, I, and then I continue in the same pattern. On this oscillating one, yeah, maybe they go back and forth like this, or maybe they oscillate like this. Um, you couldn't pin it down and say the hole's here or the hole's here. It's it's kind of floating around. A hole is just one stationary location that's missing. missing. Good question, though. Anything else? Okay. So uh, an imprecise way of talking about continuity is to say that you know you can draw the whole thing without pick, er, without lifting up your pencil. If we wanted to be more precise, and this is a definition that you'll find in the textbook, it's very short. It says f of x is continuous at a if the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals f of a. So if we put that in words, and we're going to kind of break this down a little bit more, it says the limit must exist, so this side has to exist, and it's got to be equal to the function value. So if the limit is going to exist, and this is a two-sided limit. We'll talk about uh, continuity from uh, one side in, in a few minutes. Okay, So this means the two-sided limit exists. So that means this side, the left side, has to approach the right side. They have to approach the same point, and they have to agree. Okay? So the two sides, the limits from the two sides have to agree. And the function value has to exist. Okay, So we've got to have a function value right at the point of interest. And they've all got to be equal. So this is a, a three-part test for continuity. So the first thing we check for is, does the function exist there? So does f of a exist? So f of a exists. The next thing we check is, does the limit exist? And just because they both exist doesn't mean we've got continuity. The results in part one and part two are equal, or they're the same. Okay, so we've, we've kind of been beating around the bush here for a while. We've been talking about limits, and there are times where we're thinking, well, wait a minute, why don't we worry about what happens at the function, or at the point of interest, okay? That's more dealing with continuity, so let's make sure this is clear. Here's the big difference between continuity and just plain old limits. Limits have nothing to do with what's happening at f of a. We don't care. The function can exist. It cannot exist. It can equal the limit. doesn't make any difference. Okay? So it doesn't have anything to do with what's happening at f of a. It has to do with what's happening around f of a. Okay? So what's happening in a little neighborhood around there. Okay? Continuity has everything, oops, everything to do with what's happening at f of a and what's happening around. So we've got to check a couple things. We've got to check what's happening around the point of interest as well as what's happening at the point of interest. So as usual, it's, it's pretty easy to look at a graph and check continuity or check limits, and we're going to start with that, and then we'll move to functions. So for each one of these, for each one of these points, we're going to figure out, is it continuous or is it discontinuous? And if it is discontinuous, we're going to state which of these three criteria does it fail. So remember, the first thing we're going to check is, does the function exist there? The second thing we're going to check is, does the limit exist there? And it's a two-sided limit for the time being. And then the last thing we're going to check is, do they equal each other? Okay. Now, if it fails one, it's also going to fail three. So just write down the first criteria that it fails. Everybody clear on that? Um, if it fails one it's going to fail three, and if it fails two, it's going to fail three. So just write down the first one that it fails, okay? So if, we, if our point of interest is one, so here's one. First thing we check is, does the function exist there? Does it? No. So it fails criteria number one. The function doesn't even exist there. If the function doesn't exist there, there's no hope of it being continuous at that point, okay? Let's check two. Does the function exist there? Yes, it does. It's right there. It's up there at 3. Does the limit exist? Yes, it does. It approaches 1 from either side. Okay. Do those two things equal each other? They don't. Okay. So it fails part 3. The function exists there. The limit exists. 
but because they don't equal each other. In other words, this function value right here is not in the right place. It would be great if it were right there, because then they would agree. Okay? But it doesn't. The limit exists, the function exists, but they don't agree, so it's not continuous there. Okay, let's take a look at three. Does the function exist? Yes. Does the limit exist? Nope. It approaches from the left side, it approaches two. From the right side, it approaches one. So it fails criteria number two. At four, does the function exist? Yes, it does. Does the limit exist? It does. It's approaching two from this side, and it's approaching two from this side. And lo and behold, the function value is right where we need it. So it is continuous. Okay? All three of these were discontinuous. Okay, what about 4.5? It's continuous. What about at 5? It's discontinuous. Why? Which one does it fail? First one, the function doesn't exist there. Okay, there's a vertical asymptote there. And what about at 7? Okay, it doesn't have a two-sided limit. Okay, in a minute we're going to talk about continuity from one side. So we're going to leave that alone for just a second. We're also going to come back in a minute and fill this other box out over here that talks about uh, intervals of continuity. Okay. So, it's really easy to look at a graph and say, oh, there's a hole there. Oh, there's a jump right there. Or there's an infinite discontinuity and say, clearly, it can't be continuous there. I can see the different pieces of the function right there. Okay, but we also want to be able to tell by just dealing with a function. So, we're going to check the three-part uh, criteria here. So, f of x is the square, excuse me, cube root of x minus six, uh, 8, and we're going to check at a of 16. So we want to check to see whether or not it's continuous at 16. So the first thing we check is, what is f of 16? Does it even exist there? Plug in a 16. 16 minus 8 is 8. Cube root of 8 is 2. So the function does exist there. Okay. Now we want to check and see whether or not the limit as x approaches 16 of the cube root of x minus 16 exists. Uh, there's some notes right there on the corner. Okay. Does that limit exist? Yes, it does. How can you evaluate that limit? Limit as x approaches 16 of the cube root of x. Whoops. That should be an 8. Sorry. How can you evaluate that? So we're, we're looking right here. This is number one. We know the function exists. Number two, criteria two for continuity at a point is, does the limit exist? And does this limit exist? You can use substitution. Yeah, if you plug it in by substitution, the limit would be two. So the function exists. The limit exists. Do they equal each other? Part three, they are equal. Okay, those two things are equal. So f of x equals cube root of x minus 8 is continuous. And I'll just write cont, that's okay, at a equals 16. And on the final exam, there have been times where they have actually said, um, you know, show that this is continuous by using the three-part test for continuity. This is what you'd want to show. Okay? Make sense? Okay, you're just literally checking those three things. And if it passes those three things, then it's continuous. So let's take a look at B. Does the function exist at negative 2? So does G of negative 2 exist? Nope, does not exist. Because if we plugged it in, the denominator would be 0, right? So because it doesn't exist, not continuous at a equals negative 2. Or we'd say it's discontinuous. Any questions? If it says, if it says use the three-part 
criteria. Yeah, you would. Um, if nothing else, at least mentally run through your mind and think about what it would be. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So if we take a look at this, again, we've, we've examined this a couple of different times. So it looks like this. So it's just kind of going back and forth. Oh, B? Yeah, it would be a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you could factor that and it would cancel. Okay, but if we're just talking about continuity, it's discontinuous. If we want to be more specific, you could say it's a whole. Okay, so if you think about sine of x over x, we've drawn this graph several times. Okay, looks like that. It's got a little hole right here, so it says everywhere but zero, it looks like that graph. And right at zero, it is zero. So, does h of zero exist? Yep. What is the limit of h of x as x approaches zero? It's one. Remember that limit is one. And do they equal each other? Not equal. So we'd say discontinuous at a equals zero. Sine of x over x is a continuous function except for that one little point right there. So if we were given the option to take this piecewise function right here and write a new one that was continuous, so we'd have sine of x over x when x is not equal to 0 and when x is equal to 0. How could we change this if we were given the option? How could we change this and rewrite the problem so that it was continuous, Ben? Yeah, have it be 1. Because that's the only problem. We had a function value, we had a limit, but they weren't equal. So if we were given the option, let's just change where that little point is. Let's move it up here and fill in that hole. Sometimes we call that a removable discontinuity. Okay? But usually we're not given that type of option. Okay? We've got a hole, we've usually got a removable discontinuity. And all we need is to plug that little hole, have the function value be at the right place. Any questions? Okay, now let's talk about some of those other ideas and we'll come back to the top of the page in just a second. Okay, so these are some other definitions. Okay, left continuous. So f of x is left continuous if as we approach the point of interest from the left, it equals the function value. Just like you'd think. And right continuous, it's right continuous at uh, A if the limit as X approaches A from what side? From the right, from the positive side of F of X is equal to F of A. And then here's a definition. Um, we're going to need to keep track of this and we're going to run into a couple of technicalities here. Okay, continuous on an interval. F of X must be continuous at every point on a given interval. Okay, it's exactly what it sounds like, but we've got to be careful about how we can handle the endpoints. How we handle the endpoints. Okay, so let's take a look at this right here and let's talk about where this is continuous. So let's leave out the endpoints for just a second. Endpoint of A and endpoint of B. Everywhere in between, would that be continuous? Yeah, so the interval of continuity would go from A to B. Then let's check this left endpoint. So let's check this point right here. Okay, and make sure, I'll put a big circle around it. Okay, three part test. Does the function exist there? Yes, it does. Now, because it's a left endpoint, we'd want to check continuity from the right, from the positive side. Does it have a limit from the right? Yes, it does. Are they equal to each other? Yeah, it doesn't come up here and go like that, and then the function's up here. It goes to the right place. Okay? So we're going to say that that's continuous. So we're going to put a closed endpoint on that. Let's check this one down here. Let's check B. Does it have a function value at B? No. So is there any way it could be continuous? Nope. So we're going to put a round bracket around there, parentheses around that. 
Okay, let's check this one right here. Clearly, it's going to be from A to B. And then the question is, is it continuous at the left endpoint? It has a function value. It has a limit from the right. If we're at the left endpoint, we check continuity from the right. So it does have a limit. And do they equal each other on the left endpoint? Okay, on the left endpoint. So we include A. Now, check B. Has a function value. It's right up here. Has a limit. They approach that right there. So the first two things exist. Do they equal each other? Nope. But for a different reason. This one failed, part one. Didn't even have a function value. This one failed, part three. Had a function value, had a limit, but they don't equal each other. Okay? What do you think this one is? Yeah, it's continuous from A to B. If you check those, the function values exist at each endpoint. It has limits at each endpoint from the respective direction. So from the right on the left end and from the left on the right end. Seems a little bit weird to say that. And they equal each other at each one of those endpoints. Okay? So closed interval. And what about this one right here? What about example D? Yeah, it's just going to be from A to B. It's only the interior that's continuous. It's not continuous at either one of the endpoints. Okay? Any questions there? Okay, let's go back up to the top and let's look at this again. So now let's deal with 7. 7 is an endpoint. A while ago, if our definition was simply it had to have a two-sided limit, this would fail continuity because it doesn't exist over here. But if we're dealing with a right endpoint, which is what this is, does it have a function value? Yes. If we're on a right endpoint, we check continuity where you check the limit from the left. Does it have a left-sided limit? Yes, it does. Do they equal each other? Yes, it does. So we say it's continuous. Okay? It would be continuous there. Okay? All right, now here's where it gets a little bit interesting. Let's talk about the intervals of continuity. Okay? It would be continuous from 0 to 1. What type of bracket do I put around the 0? Round or square? Square. Okay? Closed endpoint and it's in the right place. So it's going to be square here. What about at 1? Round. Okay. Then starting up again, I've got another little interval of continuity. It goes from 1 to 2. Right? Then I've got another interval of continuity. It goes from 2 to 3. Open endpoints. Okay, then I've got another fairly long interval of continuity. Take a look at this piece right here. We're on an endpoint. Is it continuous at 3? Okay, if you're just talking about intervals, it is. Because look at that endpoint. It is a left endpoint. Does the function exist there? Yes. Is it continuous from the right? Or does it have a limit from the right? Yes. And does it equal the function value there? Yes, it does. That seems really weird to say it's not continuous on this side, but it is continuous on this side. And then, of course, we'd go to 5. There's an infinite discontinuity there. Start up again at 5 and go to 7. And we already talked about 7. Square around bracket on the 7. Square. Okay. Nice little technicality there. That 3 seems a little bit weird, but that's the way it is. Okay, it's discontinuous as we come from the left. It's continuous if we come from the right. Yeah. Oh, uh, because because we're talking about where is it continuous, and that's a question about the x. So we're talking about we're saying on this interval. Okay, we're not saying from here up to here. We're talking about x coordinates where it's continuous. That work? Good question. Good question. Anything else? Okay. Um, the other reason for that would be if you were going to say this is from three to infinity, you'd really want to say it's from one to infinity. 
Nope. Nope. The, these, these, these function values could be way up at, you know, 4 million if they needed to be. We're talking about where can we draw the graph without picking up our pencil on little intervals. Okay? Good question. Anything else? Okay. So then we get into stuff like this, and this is where we get a little bit technical. Um, so there's a definition called continuous on its domain continuous on its domain, okay? So this is just like it sounds. Everywhere it's defined, it should be continuous. If there's a place where it's not defined, we wouldn't count that as a point of discontinuity, technically speaking, okay? And if somebody just says continuous, we normally interpret that as continuous on its domain, but it's always better to be specific when you're saying, you know, hey, this is continuous, but only on its domain. And let's look at an example. Okay, we just talked about that. So the question is, is it continuous? Continuous on its domain, or is it discontinuous? And when we say continuous, most people will assume that there aren't any domain issues. So if there are some domain issues, it would be good if we pointed that out, help people understand that we know exactly what we're talking about. So in looking at this graph right here, should we say, yeah, that's continuous? Or should, would it be better to say it's continuous on its domain? Or should we say it's discontinuous? Okay. The best way to describe this would be to say it's continuous on its domain. Because everywhere it's defined, is it continuous? The only place it's not defined at zero and everywhere else, it's this nice connected graph. I'd say it's continuous on its domain has discontinuity at x equals zero. That would be the best way to describe it. Because if somebody just said, hey, that's continuous, well, gosh, there's, there's an infinite discontinuity there. How are you explaining that? Oh, well, it's continuous on its domain. Oh, I see. Okay. So it would be better if you just uh, cut to the chase and said, look, it's continuous on its domain. You're acknowledging that it's got a domain issue. Okay. And then you're saying, yeah, it's got a discontinuity at x equals zero. But that one point is not in the domain. Okay, that's the point there. Questions? Yeah. So continuous on its domain. You have a vertical asymptote. Right. Okay, what's the domain for this function? Everything but zero. So the only place where it's discontinuous is happens to be the one place that's not in its domain. Got it? Again, the technicality. Okay. Always better to be specific. Okay, let's take a look at this one. This is that. Uh, this is called a, a different notation for the greatest integer function, a floor function, um, and it looks like this again. Is there any way we'd call that continuous? Continuous on its domain. The domain is all reals, okay? This has a bunch of points of discontinuity. At every single integer, you've got a jump discontinuity. So the best description for this would be, that's, con that's discontinuous under any definition. And then let's take a look at the last one. What's the domain? All reals, we don't have any domain issues. Look at the two of these. Okay? We had a domain issue here. We had a weird function that we ran into right here. Okay? Anytime you've got logarithms, even roots, division, any weird functions like a step function, you've got to be much more careful. But if you're dealing with a plain old polynomial, that's going to be continuous. And we really wouldn't even have to say on its domain because what is its domain? all real numbers, which everybody assumes is the domain for any function unless you state otherwise, right? 
Okay, go ahead and flip the page over. So let's talk about these right here, and this might be a little bit frustrating here because some of these are going to be yeah, a yes or a no, or it depends, or maybe, depending on what definition you're using. Okay, so if we're dealing with a polynomial like 2x plus 2 or 5x squared minus x plus 2, those are polynomials. Okay, so the statement is all polynomials are continuous. Is that a yes, is that a no, or is that a maybe? That's a definite yes. Polynomials are always continuous. Okay? Once they did something weird, like throw a piecewise function in there or something like that. But if it's just, hey, here's our function and it's a polynomial, polynomials are awesome. We're going to use them all the time because they, they are nice and smooth and continuous. They've got all, all these nice properties. Okay? So then I've got a couple of rational functions next. I've got 1 over x minus 2, and then I've got this nasty thing, uh, 3x squared minus 6x plus 7 over x squared plus 1. So let's think about this for just a second. Does that have a domain issue? And if so, where is it? At 2. You can't plug in at 2. If we were to graph it, what does it have on the graph at x equals 2? It has a vertical asymptote. Is that discontinuous? You bet it is. Well, it's a point of discontinuity, but it's not in its domain. So technically, this would be continuous on its domain, right? Take a look at this one right here, the next one. There's nothing you can plug in to make the denominator equal to zero. So the domain is all real numbers, and I've got a polynomial on the top and a polynomial on the bottom. I'm not going to run into any issues, so that one's going to be continuous, okay? So the best way to describe rational functions is they should be continuous on their domains. Again, by saying they're continuous on their domains, you're acknowledging, hey, there might be some domain issues. We've got an example right here, this first one. It's got a vertical asymptote. We've got an example right here. Doesn't have any vertical asymptotes, holes, jumps, or anything like that. Okay? What about trig functions? Sine and cosine are from one end to the other. They just do this. But what about tangent? Arc cosine. Arc cosine looks something like this. That doesn't have any asymptotes. Goes like that. But tangent. So think about all the trig functions. Could you make a blanket statement, statement and say they are always continuous? No, you couldn't. Could you say they're continuous on their domain? Yes, you could. And just out of curiosity, can you tell me why, if I were to graph tangent of x, why does it have vertical asymptotes? Think about the definition of tangent, yes. It's, it's sine over cosine, right? It's got division in it. So whenever cosine is zero, you're going to have a vertical asymptote on tangent. Okay? That's what produces that infinite discontinuity. Okay? What about exponentials and logarithms? Exponentials, those are going to be continuous. What about logarithms? Yeah. Okay, so all exponentials and logarithms continuous, yes, no, maybe, answer there is going to be yes, okay, and one of the reasons why is, how are these two related? They're inverses, so if this one is continuous, I mean if this is all in one piece, if you take that and reflect it across the line y equals x or find the inverse, shouldn't it still be in one piece? If they truly are inverses, they should be, okay, what about root functions? Are all root functions continuous? Okay. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it depends. If we were to just say all root functions, it depends on what you're plugging in. Maybe you plug in a rational. Okay. We're gonna say usually on domain. Okay. You'd have to do something really weird to make a root function so it wasn't continuous. Yeah. Yeah. 
Sure. This one right here is an example of one that's not continuous on its domain. It's, it's discontinuous because it's defined for all real numbers. Every number has a value. Okay. And yet we've got, um, we can pick a point right here where the function exists up here. The two sided limit doesn't exist. So it would be discontinuous at points that are in its domain. Yeah. Zach? Uh, let's see. So we had an example like that. Uh, this one right here. This would look like x plus 2, and it would have a hole right there. We could say it's continuous on its domain. Okay. But again, do you see how if you just say, hey, it's continuous, you're giving somebody the impression that it's continuous everywhere for all real numbers. If you say it's continuous on its domain, you're giving them a hint that maybe there's an issue because we've got some domain problem. And then if you went a little bit further like we did on this example right here, we say this one is continuous on its domain and it's got a discontinuity on the graph at x equals zero. See how that's more specific? Okay. And these are just, I just want to make sure you're aware of the technicality so if you got in an argument with somebody, you'd be, you'd be equipped here. Um, there are mathematicians that argue about whether or not we ought to include, um, you know, on its domain or just continuous and stuff like that. Okay, they're just technicalities. All right. Any questions? Okay. So um, there's a theorem in your book that says basically if you've got some continuous functions, you can add them, subtract them, multiply, divide them, raise them to an integer power, and you still get a continuous function as long as we haven't introduced any domain issues. So the domain issues we're talking about, logs of zero or negative, even roots of negatives, and dividing by zero. Okay. And then there's another theorem that says not only can you do these operations, but you can also do composites of continuous functions. You can take one function and plug it into another function, and as long as they're both continuous, their composites are going to be continuous. Okay. So think about 2x. And think about sine of x, those two functions. Are they continuous? Yeah. So what would happen if we add them together? Still continuous. What would happen if I plugged one into the other? Still continuous. Okay, let's think about this. 2x is f. Now g of x is the cube root, cube root, that's important, of x squared. What can we say about 2x over the cube root of x squared. Is that going to be continuous? Okay, we, we just introduced a, disc, uh, a domain issue. It's going to be discontinuous where? At x equals 0, because that's going to be in the denominator. That's not going to be allowed. So we'll have a discontinuity at x equals 0. 2x. 1 over x minus 2. What can be said about the continuity of f of g of x? So that's going to be 1 over 2x minus 2. Is it continuous or discontinuous? Okay, it's discontinuous. Where? At x equals positive 1. And the reason for that is, think about where, where the domain issue is on this one. The domain issue on this one is at 2. What do I plug into this one to produce a 2? I plug in a 1. If you plug in a 1 here, you're going to try and plug in a 2 here. That's why we exclude the 1 from where this graph would be continuous. Any questions? I, the most specific way you could describe it would you, you'd say it's discontinuous and then locate the point of discontinuity. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so in, uh, in this section, they include something called the Intermediate Value Theorem. Um, it's a really important theorem that we use all the time. You've actually used it in a lot of your pre-calculus classes without even thinking about it. If you've graphed something on your calculator and asked it to find wh where it crosses the x-axis, you've actually used this without even knowing it. Okay, So this is called the Intermediate Value Theorem for Continuous Functions, or the IVT. Um, 
intermediate meaning middle. So another way you could think about this is the middle values theorem. And if you think about middle values, hopefully this makes a little bit more sense, but it's got to be for a continuous function. And here's how it's stated. If f of x is continuous on AB, on the closed interval from AB, then f covers all the values from f of A to f of B as x goes from A to B. And here's what this means. Let's say I've got A right here and I've got B right here. And let's say F of A is down here. So here's F of A and here's F of B. So F of A is right here. F of B is right here. If this is continuous, is there any way for me to get from here to here, from there to there, without covering every one of these values here? No, nope, not if it's continuous. In fact, one way to do it would be to do it that way. So we could just go straight from here to here. Okay, that would be one way. We could also do this. We could kind of wiggle around a whole bunch like that. Does it still cover all the values from f of a to f of b? Yeah, it does. Covers all of them. Take, take that red graph and squish it onto the y-axis. Does it cover every one of them? Covers all of them, right? That make sense? Could I do this? That would still cover all of them. It would cover them more than once, right? Okay. So that's what the intermediate value theorem is talking about. So it's it's important because it it uh, guarantees that uh, we have some roots in some cases. So let's take a look at example 10. It says if f of x is continuous on this interval from 0 to 5, and f of 0 is negative 1 and f of 5 is 3, what values must f cover between x equals 0 and x equals 5? So let's take a look at a picture here. So f of 0 is negative 1, and f of 5 is 3. And it says it's continuous. So that's negative 1, and that's 3. It says, what values must f cover between 0 and 5? From negative 1 to 3. It's got to cover all of those. And if it goes from a negative value to a positive value, what must happen in between 0 and 5? It's got to cross the x-axis. Okay? So the last thing I want to do is just a quick application of this, and then I'll, I'll leave you to just kind of look at example 12 and, and uh, kind of ponder those. So it says, does the equation x cubed plus x plus 1 equals 0 have a solution on this interval? Well, here's how we check. Figure out what f of negative 1 is. f of negative 1 would be negative 1 minus 1 plus 1, so that would be negative 1. Figure out what f of 1 is. f of 1 is 1 plus 1 plus 1, so that's going to be a 3. So if it goes from having a negative value here to having a positive value here, what has to happen in between? It's got to cross 0 because it's got to cover all the values between negative 1 and positive 3, and right in between there is the x-axis. So it had to cross there. Okay. Any questions? Okay, that's uh, just an application of uh, continuous functions that we use all the time. Okay, so if you take a look at those last couple of problems, again, if you have questions, um, I'll wrap this up, and then if you want to stick around after for a few minutes, I'd be happy to entertain those. But do take a look at example 12. There are a couple interesting things there.